All right, welcome back to MedEd Animation. This is going to be one of those pieces of my playlist or series focusing on some of the learning theory and cognitive sort of principles that apply to making educational videos and animation. So this one's gonna be a primer on the idea of cognitive load and so defining cognitive load and thinking about principles related to that that will influence how we make videos and deliver information to learners. So this first slide will just be a bit of vocabulary and we'll sort of go down the list and then on subsequent slides we'll make it come to life a bit more. So working memory. The idea of working memory is when we take in information through our senses, we then juggle it for about 30 seconds in our working memory before it either gets dumped and lost forever or we successfully transition it over to long-term memory. So working memory has this limited capacity and limited lifespan. Versus long-term memory, which by contrast, as the name implies, it lasts long-term. And it also actually has a very large capacity. So for the normal human, uh, long-term memory is not a limitation. There's actually a lot of capacity in there, and it's just a matter of effectively getting information into that learner's noggin. So all the work of the teacher is really around how do we get stuff into the senses, into the working memory, and packaged nicely so that it makes it quickly, efficiently, in an organized way from working memory to long-term memory, or processed. Cognitive load. So cognitive load is this general term that I like to describe very eloquently as the mental oomph needed to complete a learning task. So what is the overall brain effort? How tired will your brain feel from learning something new? And then cognitive load has some subcategories. So the first one is intrinsic load. So intrinsic load is the amount of mental oomph the fr or the fraction of cognitive load that's inherent, intrinsic, built in, inseparable from the information you're trying to learn. So let's say you're trying to memorize the first 20 elements of the periodic table. Intrinsic load is really the minimum mental effort that's just inherent in memorizing those facts. And so then at first you might be thinking, so what isn't intrinsic load? Because that sounds like all learners do, right? They take in information and it gets stored. Well, no, it's actually more complicated than that. Because then there's also extraneous or extrinsic load. And extrinsic load is anything usually bad. Basically, any mental effort that is not inherent to the intrinsic learning task. So on one hand, this could be if you're reading a textbook about the periodic table and there's extra facts about the elements you don't care about, that would be extraneous load. But also, if the learner is hungry, tired, having stress at home, having learning issues or disabilities, those are all also forms of extraneous load. So it's everything that leads to extra mental effort and interferes. And in the setting of audiovisual, it refers to any unnecessary pictures or flashing lights or colors or anything else distracting. The more nuanced of the three subcategories of cognitive load is germane load. Um, and this has some varying definitions across the literature, but the one I've adopted based on my reading is that it's additional mental effort that is used to facilitate learning, but is not intrinsic to the information itself. And while for extraneous load, more is usually worse, for germane load, it's more of like a a parabola where there's some optimal amount of germane load where too little basically means the learner's just passively sitting there trying to absorb information and there's also too much where there's so much extra work to cleverly take in that information that you end up not remembering what you're supposed to learn. Um, and so we'll show this a couple other ways but germane load is really where a lot of the money's at. When people try to make fun animations and videos and interactive games and all these things there's some optimal amount of that that works the best. So I like to use the giraffe example. So let's say I was going to teach you about asthma. And I got up there in front of a group of medical students and I brought up this giraffe. And I told the learners, and so you can do this now with me, right? Okay, so, so imagine that this giraffe has asthma. I want you to close your eyes and picture this giraffe in your mind. He's on the savannah, 
in Africa, and he has really bad asthma, and he needs to learn how to use his inhaler. Okay, now pause. At this point, you've done a bunch of mental work, right? You've done some pretty significant mental effort. You've bought into my weird metaphor. You're curious where it's going to go. You're engaged. You're doing mental work to picture this poor giraffe with asthma. Have you learned anything new about asthma yet? No, right? So all the mental work you just did, assuming it ends up being relevant to learning, was not intrinsic load. And uh, hopefully it wasn't too much extraneous load if I end up pulling off some amazing metaphor. Um, it was germane load. It was sort of you're paying credit up front uh, and then hoping to pay it off later with better learning. So whether or not the germane load of, is effective, you can't answer that yet because you don't know if the next thing out of my mouth would be something totally irrelevant or an amazing analogy that's going to help you really understand asthma. And so that mental work is an example of germane load. So another way I like to represent this whole concept is with a visual metaphor or allegory, I guess. So in this metaphor, we're going to represent long-term memory on the left there as a big warehouse with lots of unlimited capacity. But you really have to store things on the right shelf in there, so it has to come in organized. Then in the middle, you have this boat called working memory that's going to ship information back and forth, but it really has a limited capacity and a limited amount of time it can hold the cargo before it dumps it overboard. And then on the bottom right, we have our poor little learner there digging through any educational sensory input, whether it be a PowerPoint, a video, a textbook, anything, um, and looking for those gemstones of good information, but trying to sift through the dirt and not pick up extra dirt by accident. So let's see this in video form and see how it unfolds. Bloop. Okay, so again, we have our educational sensory inputs, podcast, textbook, video, etc. Uh, we have our long-term memory waiting to have nicely packaged information stored. We have plop, our working memory boat with limited capacity and limited time to shuttle information across. So let's see what happens. So first, uh, we have our poor little learner in there digging through the dirt. There's all this unnecessary information in this talk. Where's the actual information? Um, and eventually he finds the intrinsic load, which are the little gemstones but it's surrounded by extraneous load, which is all that dirt. So the learner, he or she, is digging, 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 um, and eventually some of those gemstones, those useful nuggets of information, get plopped on the boat, on the working memory. The working memory shuttles it across quickly, quickly. Limited capacity, limited time. And because it's all just disorganized information, uh, the brain tries to store as much as it can. Long-term memory is like, come on, we have lots of room, but you have to give it in order. So they try to get some of the green ones in, and then everything else is lost. So time-sensitive dumping. Now we had something called a schema. So we're going to organize things in a more um, deliberate way as we give the information. And so the learner will kind of know where to package the information as they're receiving it. So maybe you're comparing and contrasting things. You're explaining that there are three groups of something. You know, more organized teaching. Now there's a little better transmission because it's already packaged in working memory. And so long-term memory is ready to receive more of that. And finally, this yellow tractor, I like to think of as using a lot of fuel, right? It's another fuel-efficient, heavy thing, but if this is some really awesome use of germane load, like a rich media advanced organizer, so like some cool character-based video animation that you create, if it's good, it'll be worth its weight in gas because the learner can immerse itself in that tool and pick up information really quickly, organize it efficiently, and so it'll pay off on the back end. But on the other hand, if it's a bad tool, if the video is weird or distracting, or it's just such a gas guzzler as far as cognitive load, it may not be worth it. And so our job as teachers is to design the best possible tractor we can. And of course, this is all very meta because I took a risk with this high cognitive load metaphor to explain the concept of cognitive load. Woohoo! So there are some things we can do to mitigate cognitive load. Um, some of them are intuitive just to the terms themselves, right? So now when you talk to your peers and colleagues about making educational videos, you can say, maybe this part of the video, these pictures are just extraneous load and they're not adding much to the learning, etc. cetera. Um, some other specific concepts, there's one called signaling. If you're not sure what it is, hopefully that helps. So signaling is used a lot by PowerPoint. It's basically anything that you use 
uh, to emphasize or direct attention. So it's as simple as it sounds. You can make things change size, color, they can move, uh, and there could also be sound effects and sounds and music that are forms of signaling. So of course, when we make videos, every time we create change or contrast or sounds or anything, we are, whether we like it or not, creating a signaling effect. So being very deliberate about when and where we are directing learners' attention is important. The next bullet is advanced organizers, which are another important way of directing cognitive load um, and also relates to that schema idea with those storage, uh, storage racks in the last video. Um, but I have a separate video on advanced organizers that I'll post if it hasn't been posted already. And then the third one is this idea of dual coding and multimedia learning. And so for our last slide here, I'm going to explain these concepts a bit more. So dual coding is the idea that when a learner is taking in information through their vision and their auditory inputs, uh, it's sort of a make or break sort of deal. So this guy Pyvio in 1990 suggested this idea of dual coding, that if you are um, concordantly giving relevant information visually and auditorily, you're, you can functionally expand working memory. So that boat with limited capacity can actually have a little bit of a bigger deck and hold a little more information as it makes its way to long-term memory. However, if those pieces of information are discordant, like if there's a picture of a dancing monkey on the screen, but I'm talking about dancing giraffes, that could be uh, detrimental and of course have the opposite effect. So in short, dual coding is the idea that relevant visuals and auditory inputs together, such as in a video, can perhaps expand working memory and therefore be useful for teaching. And then some people in the later, in, you know, later in the 90s and into the 2000s started calling a similar idea the multimedia learning theory, which just applies the dual coding concept to multimedia, as far as I can tell. So just the idea that things like videos, online, interactivity, games, all this stuff leverages these multi-sensory inputs to expand working memory and enhance learning. And as I was going through this literature and learning about this, it was also the time when I was learning more about animation, and there was a term that animators kept using when talking about the history of animation and where they are now that reminded me of this concept, and that is magic. So I don't just mean this to be cutesy. There are a couple reasons that the word magic comes up in animation. One is a historical aspect that started out as almost a form of magic show. Um, but also I think when animators talk about their work, there are so many people working in these little silos, people drawing the images, coloring them in. Um, in the 3D world, there's the riggers, the sculptors, the uh, render, you know, all these lighting, all these different effects, plus the sound, the sound effects, the scoring, which is so integral. Um, and a lot of people talk about how life really only appears in the animation when all these sensory inputs and these different aspects are put together. Um, and so I think this idea of synergy of the senses is communicated across both this learning theory world as well as the animation world. So that's my plug. So think about dual coding equals magic, uh, and you should leverage it when you teach using multimedia. I hope this was helpful. And um, as a reminder, don't forget to check out the rest of this YouTube channel where we have a playlist for more learning theory concepts like this, as well as other playlists about uh, different softwares for animation like Synfig, Krita, Inkscape, and so on. Um, so I hope you find it helpful for whatever brought you to this page. Thank you.